I'm sure you've noticed, but I don't generally talk about the Mueller investigation or these convictions very much. Because what we don't know, well with this administration, good luck guessing correctly. And what we do know, well that's getting shoved down our throats 23 hours a day, with the other hour being ads in between those reports. Today I think I can actually provide a deeper understanding of the upcoming legal and political battle by looking at arguments from a Supreme Court case from 1974. The story begins with a special counsel and a president firmly on the defense. This afternoon I received from the White House a letter declining to furnish the eight requested tapes. Careful study before requesting the tapes convinced me that any blanket claim of privilege to withhold this evidence from the grand jury is without legal foundation. It therefore becomes my duty promptly to seek subpoenas and other available legal procedures for obtaining the evidence for the grand jury. So let's back up, because for those of us not old enough to remember a time when we loved Iran and hated Russia, well, we might not know what the heck he's talking about. So let me set the stage. A grand jury had just returned indictments against seven of President Richard Nixon's closest allies in the Watergate affair, and the special prosecutor sought audio tapes of the conversations recorded by Nixon in the Oval Office. There were over 3,700 hours of tapes in total that play like one of the most boring podcasts out there. I mean, it's even got long recaps of Archie Bunker episodes discussing gay conspiracies and pretty much anything else that popped into his head. Basically, if he had a Twitter, he would be somewhere between Donald Trump and Alex Jones. Unfortunately for him, eight of his tapes had clear evidence that he had been involved in the Watergate scandal. Everybody's satisfied. They're all out of jail. They've all been taken care of. They kind of all, you know, they've done a lot of discreet checking to be sure there's no discontent in the ranks and there isn't any. Yeah, that basically proved that Nixon was directly involved in the covering up of the Watergate burglary. So that might sound simple. There was an impeachment vote coming up in Congress and this was all shaping up to be a very Hollywood release the tapes fight for justice feel good moment presumably taking place on the steps of the Supreme Court in the rain. Let me just throw a quick monkey wrench in that whole perception though, because there were two trials going on at the same time. You had the impeachment trial being led by the House Judiciary Committee, who were the ones who originally subpoenaed the tapes and ended up getting something more censored than an Eminem song on Radio Disney. They got angry, and don't blame them, after listening to Nixon yammer on about Jews and blacks with nothing incriminating, I'd be annoyed too. His response? Eh, you have no jurisdiction over me. I uh, do think that uh, the president up to now has, uh, has tried to define the limits of the jurisdiction of the committee when, when that jurisdiction was given to the committee by the House. Well, don't do you, you think that the president? Do you think that the president is now complying with the what the committee's request? Well, uh, no, it isn't. He isn't. He, no, he is not. That would have been the end of it too, except for this somewhat odd secret grand jury ruling being led by a special prosecutor that listed Nixon as an unindicted co-conspirator in the Watergate trial. This investigation picked up the case of trying to subpoena unedited copies of the tapes, which opened up a Pandora's box of legal challenges. So let's dive right in. We'll hear arguments uh, in number 73-1766, United States of America against Nixon. Alright, so United States versus Nixon, a bit on the nose with that case name, but somewhat accurate. A huge problem with this case is separation of powers. Nixon had total executive privilege when it came to what he had to give the legislative branch of government. But the special counsel is a part of the executive branch, so why not just give it to the special counsel? This case is different in that the decision in this case will have an unde undeniable impact on another proceeding. And another proceeding which the Constitution says is essentially a political proceeding from which the court is excluded 
Now, I know Congress is perpetually behind, but there's no way that these unedited tapes, when presented in one trial, couldn't immediately influence the impeachment trial going on next door. Let me put it this way, imagine if this... Let's shift over to, uh, to, to Cohen. As you say, counts seven and eight are specifically about the conduct involving Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. That is, they are, you know, they involve um, the, the president in a very detailed way. He is, in essence, a, a co-conspirator. Started requesting very detailed accounts of Trump's tax returns from the past decade as evidence. People might start giving it the side eye. Maybe you didn't need all of that to get a conviction, when the guy's already pled guilty. At the same time though, the special prosecutor argued that you can't not have this case tried just because there's also an impeachment proceeding coming up. The notion that because there is concurrently underway an impeachment inquiry under the, for the House of Representatives, that somehow makes this a non-justiciable political question. Uh, is, we think, a remarkable notion which is not supported by sound constitutional law or by any of the decisions of this court. I mean, could you imagine making that argument anywhere else? <laughs> yes, officer, I understand I was driving under the influence, but I'm on thin ice with my job right now, so if you could just keep this under wraps for a bit, that'd be great. This is an incredibly weird case though because, again, this is an investigation going on between two parties of the executive branch that will affect a completely unrelated investigation in the legislative branch in a way that is arguably unconstitutional, being decided by the judicial branch. Yeah, don't worry, we'll break all this down, but this wasn't by far the longest Supreme Court case I've ever heard for no reason. So before we get any further into the constitutional weeds of this situation, let's define some things. First, what is a special prosecutor? One of the express duties that's uh, delegated to the special prosecutor is that he shall have full authority <coughs> for investigating and prosecuting, among others, allegations involving the president and the delegation of authority expressly states in particular the special prosecutor shall have full authority to determine whether or not to contest the assertion of executive privilege or any other testimonial privilege. That certainly isn't your generic prosecutor. So that definitely sounds like pretty clearly the guy you would want to talk to about digging dirt on the president. The most important thing about the special prosecutor is that, well, they're special and not in the kindergarten who reads glue type of way and they're members of the executive branch who are independent of the president. Just listen to Nixon's attorney make a joke that, well, it's a little too true. So a United States attorney uh, brings a prosecution, and uh, in the course of that prosecution, he, uh, before trial, subpoenas uh, under Rule 17, 17 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, he subpoenas material uh, in the custody of the president. So what happens? The president says to the attorney general, I'm not going to produce this material. No, well, it's the United States attorney subpoenaing it under your hypothetical case. That's right. And so what happened? And the president, in my, in my view, the president would instruct the attorney general to instruct the United States attorney to withdraw his motion. And the United States attorney says, I'm not going to do that because I'm, we'd have a new I'm, United I'm States attorney. to uphold justice. And, uh, <laughs> well, now, how would you have a new, a new United States attorney? Well... Uh, I'm being a little facetious. And I well, don't no, I'm, I'm being serious. because I think, I think that serious. United States attorney, in all respects, would and should be removed from that case. Now, most of you might be thinking to yourselves, well, that's a weird thing to joke about after. The country tonight is in the midst of what may be the most serious constitutional crisis in its history. The president has fired the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, because of the president's action, the attorney general has resigned. But if you want to fire the independent counsel, you have to go through the attorney general and that's just a whole bunch of paperwork compared to the ease of replacing your run-of-the-mill attorney. That Saturday Night Massacre is why in this case we're hearing from Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski instead of Archibald Cox. With that defined, what's executive privilege? What it really narrows down to is uh, somewhat simple but very important 
issue in the administration of criminal justice, and that is whether the president, in a pending prosecution, uh, can uh, withhold material evidence from the court merely on his assertion that the evidence involves confidential communications, and this is what it really gets down to. So the president can withhold evidence somewhat arbitrarily by playing the national security card, and that could be pretty broad. <clears throat> Your Honor, if the people realize how dumb their elected leader is, well, this nation would be incredibly insecure. This is important though, because in cases of legitimate military secrets, Boop, I would hate it if D-Day plans got released early because of an incest case against the president. Yeah, sorry people who loved FDR, but he was definitely swimming in the local gene pool. Hey, at least she doesn't have to worry about whether or not to change her last name. So this brings us to another very odd point. Nobody knew exactly what was on the tapes. We're talking about thousands of hours of tapes going through there to look for evidence for the specific crime would be like going through your boyfriend's internet history to find evidence of him cheating. You might find that, but I can guarantee you, you're going to find a ton of unrelated things that, well, weren't intended for your eyes. Well, if your honor please, the uh, House of Representatives have subpoenaed well, I don't these know and more in, tapes. I don't know what's in the tapes. I assume you do. No, I don't. I don't. You don't know either. Well, how do you know that they subject to executive privilege? Well, I do know that there's a preliminary showing that they are conversations between the president and his close aides. Regardless and of what it is. Regardless of what it is, it may involve uh, a number of subjects. But does but not the special know. does not the special prosecutor claim that the subject matter is the same? He claims that, but he has no way of showing it. In fact, he says it's only probable or likely. He has no way of showing that they in fact involve the subject of Watergate. Forget Schrodinger's cat, I feel like I just walked into Schrodinger's court. So in theory, neither the prosecution or the defendants knew it was on the tape. It was an argument over the fact that the content could have had Watergate parts. Furthermore, if the tapes had Watergate's parts, could we listen to them, or would they be protected by executive privilege? This president as difficult as it was to say this, not because of the evidence, but because of the inherent awkwardness of it, this president is not in a position to claim this public privilege for the reason that a prima facie showing can be made that these conversations were not in pursuance of legitimate governmental processes or the lawful deliberation of the public's business. So in a pretty easy to follow train of logic, if you're investigating a crime and you think the president is a witness, well, an unindicted co-conspirator, but an unindicted co-conspirator who is nowhere near becoming an indicted co-conspirator, you can subpoena evidence from the president, if it has nothing to do with his duties as president, in order to win a case that won't prosecute the president. Now, this argument was met with less of a counter-argument and more of a, well, these tapes could be Pink Floyd's dark side of the moon on loop for all you know. And while they might have Watergate chats, I can guarantee you they have classified information. Furthermore, there was an odd argument about the actual need for evidence itself. Basically, this case of conspiracy against many high-level employees conspiring in Watergate was going to win. The special prosecutor had so much evidence, so why try to subpoena these tapes? Was it to not even give the defending side a pity point? Or was it to provide evidence for the completely separate impeachment hearings going on in a separate and unconnected branch of government? It's difficult for me to conceive a prosecutor who has more evidence than this prosecutor has. He has the full benefit of a Senate Select Committee investigation, which staff had 50 odd lawyers, existed for a year. He has the benefit of his own investigation, of a grand jury that sat for 19 months, with an investigative staff of similar proportions. He simply says, I need this because I want to present all of the evidence in the case. Well, that's an argument you could make. But you gotta be getting pretty close to the bottom of the peanut jar if that's the best you got. So this brings us to a critical question that the entire case revolves around. Now, I want to make it clear that the president at no point, of course, 
uh, delegated to the special prosecutor the exclusive right to pass on the question of, of executive privilege or any other privilege, attorney and client privilege, or any other testimonial privilege. What we are merely saying is that we have the clear right to test it in this court. Essentially, does anyone have the right to challenge executive privilege over communications? Or can a president just executive privilege his way through four to eight years of behind the scenes executive embarrassments? So what's the answer? Well, considering that you heard the Watergate tapes at the top of this episode, you can probably guess. In a resounding unanimous decision with Reinquist recusing himself, the Supreme Court told the president to check his executive privilege. Chief Justice Berger, no relation to the Burger King, read the decision. We conclude, therefore, that when the ground for asserting the privilege as to subpoenaed materials sought for the use in a criminal trial is based solely on the generalized interest in confidentiality as distinguished from the situations where it may be based upon military secrets or diplomatic secrets. It cannot prevail over the fundamental demands of due process of law in the fair administration of criminal justice. And the rest is history. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly Supreme Court Saturday episodes. Remember to subscribe and let freedom ring by clicking that bell. Leave me a comment if you have an important case you think I should research, and as always, thank you for watching.